Can I call you Damo? Cool. Yeah, I'm in Australia, <laughs> so I think you have to. Fantastic. <laughs> so you've had a really busy week. You've yeah. done two-day workshop. That's right. And now you've just finished two back-to-back -back presentations. Yes, that's right. And you're meeting with us now. Yep. And then you've got to jump on a plane. Then I'm going to the airport, yes. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for taking the time to meet <laughs> with us. Not at all. So it was interesting. This week, .NET Core 2.0 dropped, and we got the latest version of Visual Studio. Yep. Now is that 2017.3 or 15.3? So I think it's officially it's 2017 15.3. Okay, yeah. excellent. There's a bit of confusion there, and I was talking to some of our developers, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm on Visual Studio 2017 7.0 preview." Okay. And I'm like. What is that? I don't know what that is. Of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we've got the latest version. What are some of the exciting new features in .NET Core 2.0? So the big one uh, is the addition of .NET Standard 2. So .NET Standard 2, .NET Standard is the sort of the promise, it's the contract that all the various flavors of .NET or the different .NET platforms um, can adhere to. So that if I'm a library author or I'm a NuGet package author, I can author code that targets .NET Standard, then I'll know that that resulting assembly will load on .NET Core, .NET Framework, Xamarin, Mono, Unity, or UWP, all the places that .NET Standard is supported. So .NET Standard 2 brings back over 15,000 APIs wow. um, from the .NET Framework uh, back into .NET Standard, mm -hmm. and that is now supported in .NET Core. So .NET Core 2, as a result, gets many, many more APIs back, which means more of the existing code that's already out there from the last you know, 17 years of .NET can just run in .NET Core 2. Well, that's fantastic. So um, sometimes I like to think of .NET Standard as like a specification document. Is mm. that the right way to think about yeah, it? Yeah, so you can think of it like a spec or a, yep. or, or a contract, or if you're a C-sharp programmer, it's like an interface. So if I write an okay. interface and I accept that in my API, I have the yep. iDamian interface, um, you can give me any object that implements iDamian and I can use it. Okay. And it's a very similar thing. Yeah. Fantastic, and I heard that we now have SMTP and system.drawing. Ah, so system.drawing is not in there yet. Okay. So system.drawing, we're going to, we're looking at adding a sort of a compatibility pack in the second half of this year. Mm -hmm. It won't be part of the standard itself, but you'll be able to run it on platforms that support the standard. Um, and so, for example, we'll have a, a version of it that runs on Windows and .NET Core and a version that runs on Linux. Um, but there are lots of other things in there. System.data is back okay. in there with a lot of the, um, the data sets and table adapters and all those type of things that are back in there. So a lot of the um, you know, legacy is a strong word, but a lot of the existing code that's out there that uses all of those paradigms from early versions of .NET will now just work. Um, and then lots of lots of other things like the reflection APIs went through a mm. big change. We've brought back the existing older APIs, so a lot of that code continues to work. Um, and for people who really want to see the full list, I suggest mm. they go to the .NET standard repo on GitHub, where everything there is sort of delted and shown and what's there. Fantastic. And so we talked a little bit about moving across legacy mm. uh, tech into .NET Core. So what does that mean for .NET Framework? We move more and more of this stuff across. Does that mean .NET Framework itself is going to become legacy? I don't think so. I think it's, it's important to remember what .NET Framework is a part of. So mm -hmm. .NET Framework ships in Windows. Yes. And that means it's tied to Windows support lifecycle. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it gets installed on as many machines as Windows gets installed on. So yep. one of the original reasons and points of .NET Core existing was that we wanted to be able to ship faster than we could mm -hmm. in uh, in, than Windows can, yes. and we wanted to be able to do so without the massive compatibility burden that also, I mean, Windows, one of Windows' great strengths, right, is that it's always backwards compatible. Yes. Um, and .NET Framework has the same requirement because yep. it's part of Windows. Um, it's also why we haven't seen a side-by-side -side release of .NET Framework since 4.0. So we had 2.0 and 4.0, and then it's yep. all been 4. Dot something since then. That makes it very difficult for us to innovate like in big mm. ways inside of .NET Framework, because um, there's lots of rules about what you can and can't do. And so of by course. going to .NET Core, where most of the functionality is in packages, and then even the runtime itself can be installed side by side, yep. you can take make riskier changes, you can do things at a faster pace, and customers can still get the, um, the safety net of being able to install stuff side by side, only take updates when they want to, and mm. still have multiple applications on one server that are running on different versions of .NET that don't impact each other. Excellent, and of course, um, so with those different versions running side by side, there is a small cost to that, isn't there? So there's a little bit of a larger disk space imprint mm. and there's a little bit of a larger memory re uh, usage. But is there any sharing at all between those um, Yeah, so there's a couple of modes that you can deploy .NET Core applications mm. in. The default mode is what we call portable applications or framework mm. dependent applications, yep. where you have a, a version of the .NET Core shared framework Mm -hmm. installed in a global location. Okay. Um, and next to that is a .NET exe, or the .NET executable on Linux. And then when you run .NET My App, it's running on top of the framework from that location, but your app yep. is wherever it is. 
You can also deploy in a fully isolated mode, okay. where when you publish your application, you can say, no, I want to be completely self-contained and mm -hmm. not rely on any shared resources. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a much larger output size, obviously, because you yep. need the whole .NET framework or the .NET Core framework. But now the app is completely independent. So. Fantastic. And uh, a lot of what we've been looking at this week is ASP.NET Core. Mm. And I noticed there's been quite a bit of a change to how packages are managed, at least in development for ASP.NET right. Core. So what do we have? We have this Microsoft ASP.NET Core dot dot all. all. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we're not bringing in individual packages. That's right. So what we did, and this is we, we can only do this when we're running on .NET Core. If you're mm -hmm. running ASP.NET Core on .NET Framework, it looks mm -hmm. very much like it did in ASP.NET Core 1X. Mm -hmm. We're taking advantage of a new feature in .NET Core 2 when you run on it that allows us to have one package that basically mm. brings in all of ASP.NET Core and everything we depend on, which yep. is the .all package, which means you only have one version to worry about. It means all the API is available to you in your app without you having to find it in whatever package it's in. Fantastic. And then we mitigate the side effects of doing that, which is, oh my god, now I have all the packages in my yep. app. So that at publish time, we, only, we don't actually publish those packages with wow. your application. Yep. All those packages live in another location called the runtime store. So mm -hmm. I, I mentioned the shared framework before. We have a new yep. thing called the runtime store in .NET Core 2 where we can install the runtime assets from a package. Into that, they get optimized. They get pre-jitted, so you don't yep. pay the JIT time at, at, at uh, a startup. Excellent. Um, and you don't have to deploy them with your app. So as a result of that, if you take an ASP.NET Core 1.1 app, mm -hmm. and you publish it, and you take it side by side with an ASP.NET uh, Core 2 app, mm -hmm. and you publish that, you look at the published size of just like mm -hmm. a Hello World. Yep. Um, the first one will be about 12 megabytes. Mm -hmm. The new one will be about three. Okay, so wow. it's a drastically different output size because so yep. much more is included on the box when you install .NET Core. That is amazing. So, and it's easier to develop against because you have everything you need. Right. And then when you go to publish, it's just taking those Your parts code. that you use. That's right. Exactly. That's fantastic. And we're on that on that theme. When we move further along .NET Core, so for the next release, we're already talking about how we can go even further. So if you yep. do one of those standalone deployments or self-contained deployments, we'd love to be able to do a similar thing whereby we'd actually analyze your app, determine what you're actually using right down to the method, and then wow. we trim everything else out. Oh, so we it. still yeah. we got the photo of the go, but we've, had, we've done some amazing good progress in 2.0. That'll be excellent. And actually, uh, during the workshop, you mentioned about some new features coming in .NET Core 2.1, and of particular interest was some of those things around building RESTful APIs. Right. And so you mentioned about uh, the I action result, perhaps right. having a type on it. Can you That's talk right. about that? So what we found is when we started teaching this workshop that you're talking about, which is a, a, an app building workshop rather than a feature focused workshop, yes. um, we kind of build a separated app with an API at the back end and a front end. Um, a lot of your API code ends up being quite boilerplate, especially when you want to start using things like Swagger and Open API to describe your APIs, mm -hmm. um, because Traditionally, in MVC and ASP.NET Core, your controllers will return I action result, as mm -hmm. you said. Um, but there's no extra data about, well, what type of data is coming out of that? Is it, yeah. a, is it a customer object formatted as JSON, or is it something else? And so you would have to annotate a lot of other stuff on the method with attributes or invent a way to do that in order to get that type of data. Exactly. So what we'd like to be able to do is remove a lot of that boilerplate, be a little more opinionated about what an HTTP API in ASP.NET Core would look like. Yeah. Um, Make it be convention driven so that you can yeah. change those conventions just like you can today in ASP.NET Core. Um, and to facilitate that, there'd be this new action result of T. Yep. So then we could say, oh, you have an action method, it returns action result of customer. And then based on convention, we could infer that, oh, well, it takes an argument. So that probably means it can return 404 not found. So let's just yep. assume it can sometimes. Okay. Oh, and it also is probably, it looks like it's a CRUD method. So let's assume it can return a 203 or a 201 or whatever it might be. Excellent. And so as a result of those things, you can get all this rich metadata about your actions purely based on convention rather than you having to decorate it all over the place. That's going to be fantastic. We had this conversation at work and we're kind of thinking, oh, well, really? do we return strong types or do we return I action right. results? They both have great advantages. So we're looking forward to that feature. Fantastic. Uh, so one more question. Mm. Uh, you've talked a lot about ASP.NET Core Razor Pages. Yes. For those who are new to Razor Pages, what exactly is it? Uh, Razor Pages is my baby. So. Razor Pages is uh, it's part of MVC. It's not a separate mm -hmm. framework. It's actually built into the uh, both the MVC sort of dispatching logic and the MVC um, view engine. And it's it's simply a reorganization of how we think about the code and the assets that make up an application that serves server-side HTML. Mm -hmm. So controllers and actions, I think, are still the best way to write endpoints that don't return HTML. If you're mm -hmm. returning JSON or doing content negotiation or those things, you should okay. use controllers and actions. Razor Pages is a flavor of MVC that we've designed specifically for when you're doing server-side HTML. 
Okay. okay. So if you're doing pages with forms and CRUD and those type of things, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, um, uh, user-facing applications that go through mm -hmm. the browser, and you haven't moved to doing a SPA yet, so you're mm -hmm. still doing server-side, Razor Pages is a really, really good way of doing that. And it really just allows you to organize your application into the case of, well, I have a Razor file. It's in mm -hmm. the Pages folder. The name of the file becomes the route. Yep. Very, you know, it's all built on routing. It's built yep. on the same things that MVC is built on. I can change the route. I can yep. do it in code. I can decorate the route so that I get extra information in the page. And then I have a page model, mm -hmm. which is declared using app model, the same app model that you've already always used in Razor. Yep. And the app and in your model, your page model, is where you put all the logic for the page. That includes the handlers that actually handle the requests, which mm -hmm. are a little bit like actions on your controllers. But it also includes properties and data that you pass to the page. So okay. rather than having a separate page model to pass stuff back and forth between the controller and the page, it is the same thing. So it's kind of okay. like we've merged the view model and the controller into one file, okay. and then said that that one controller or page model only serves this page. Excellent. So we get a nice little kind of ball of stuff that is related but still separated. So the page model is fully testable. You still get dependency injection. You can still put attributes on it. Mm -hmm. You can still have multiple. You still derive. It's just C sharp. Like nothing yep. special. And then the view or the page kind of attaches to that, and you can pass data back and forward using model binding and just normal razor expressions. So that sounds awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Not a problem. Now I'll just check. Are there any questions in the audience today? Okay. Yes. One question. Would you mind just going to the microphone? Uh, Damien, uh, I understand you also manage uh, development of uh, Signal R, yeah. the online communication solution. Yeah. Could you please say a few words about it and what's the future? What should we? Yeah, create? absolutely. So Signal R, where we have a team dedicated working on Signal R right now. They've been doing it for quite some time for .NET Core. Um, like most things in ASP.NET Core, we're rewriting it from the ground up using what we've learned in the first two versions to make a better framework. Um, we plan to release an alpha of Signal R for ASP.NET Core in the next month. Hopefully, fingers crossed, cool. that will run on 2.0. So if you move to 2.0, you'll be able to install the Signal Alpha in your application and use that. Um, and then it will become part of the 2.1 release. So it won't be final Fantastic. until 2.1 is out. So that'll be yep. a little bit later. But hopefully, within a month or so, you can start using it. Um, if you've just used hubs in Signal before, pretty much that stays the same. So if you're okay. just operating at that layer, most of that code will move across pretty well. But underneath hubs, we've built an entirely new system underneath Signal called ASP.NET called Sockets. And it's going to form the foundation of our non-HTTP programming stack mm -hmm. um, after ASP.NET Core 2. So you'll be able to have hubs run on top of TCP, for example. Or you'll be able to have things like MQTT or AMQP servers, um, but still use ASP.NET Core. So we've got a nice future ahead of us that's non-HTTP with HTTP in the same app, and Signal will be able to utilize that. That sounds awesome. So looking forward to that in ASP.NET Core 2.1. 2.1 and beyond. Yeah, and what are you thinking, three months? Uh, probably a little longer than three months. Yep. Um, I think the, the cycle that you saw between 1.1 and 2.0 was a little short because we mm -hmm. knew we had to do a bunch of big changes in 2.0. Mm -hmm. Net Standard 2 was such a large release. We had to do a lot, yeah. bunch of tooling things. We made a bunch of new get improvements, and some of them were breaking. Now that we've got a solid 2.0, I think you'll see us make incremental improvements on more like a six monthly cadence okay. before we do a big major release in a few years' time again. So Excellent. no promises, but that's probably what it looks like right now. All right. Well, thanks very much, Damien, for meeting with us. I can probably today. take one or two more questions before yeah, we no head problem. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you mentioned in an earlier session about a compatibility issue to allow us to kind of do some some backward stuff, and mm. and you were talking about it being a runtime dependent thing. If there were to be APIs that weren't used, I just thought maybe you could speak a little bit more right. about. Is, can you bring projects in, or is it DLL based? Yep. Is it IL and so forth? So as part of .NET Standard 2, there's a new feature uh, in the tooling which enables any project that's running on a .NET Standard 2 compliant um, platform to reference .NET Framework. Um, projects, assemblies, or NuGet packages. Um, now, there's caveats with that. So if I'm in, a, I'm in a .NET Core 2 app, and then I reference a .NET Framework project, it'll compile. Whether it runs or not totally depends on when you load that assembly from the .NET Framework project on .NET Core 2, what APIs does it try and call? Mm -hmm. If it try and call something that's only in .NET Framework and not part of the .NET Standard 2 circle of APIs, it won't work. Okay. But we've at least unblocked the referencing via this compat shim so that you don't have to recompile and retarget um, projects that were running on .NET Framework if they're already within the scope of .NET Standard 2. Fantastic. This morning, he um, he touched on something called Blazor that he's, that he's been working yes. on. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because that, I have a lot of thoughts on Blazor, yeah. yeah. I'm keen to. So Blazor, to be very clear, was an experiment that Steve did 
um, for NDC Oslo earlier this year, where he got a version of .NET running on WebAssembly, which mm. is the sort of new subset of JavaScript bytecode that can run in modern browsers. And it's not everywhere, it's very early days, mm. um, which means that we can basically have a Razor Pages-like framework running literally in the browser. So it's, it is a SPA, it's a SPA framework that runs using C Sharp on a version of .NET in the browser. So after he did that, and he blew a couple of minds on our team, because he works for us, right? He actually works on our team. Um, we had a hackathon at Microsoft a few weeks ago, um, and I, we did a community stand-up when I was at the hackathon, for people who haven't seen it. And we had a whole bunch of us from the ASP.NET team and the .NET team hack on Blazor, and we actually tried to make it do more stuff. Uh, David Fowler and a few other blokes actually finally got debugging working. So we actually have an end-to-end, -end, uh, very hacky, let me be clear, but you know, proof, proof of concept that we could get a nice debugging experience working with that too. Um, my thoughts are that I think it's awesome, yeah. and I think mm -hmm. it's fantastic, I think it has a lot of potential. Um, I, it really, the framework developer in me, like the, pro the, the, the project manager in me, or the product manager, I should say, looks at that and goes, wow, the opportunity is to be able to build a page framework that can both run on the server and the client mm. and know when it's running on the server and the client um, in the same space is, is like really cool. So I, mm. we've been kind of thinking about the type of things we could do, but there's no commitment at all yet for mm. us to actually invest the time and effort it would do to turn it into a real framework. But we are exploring the business case right now, and we're trying to figure out uh, if we do do it, if it's worthwhile, what would the timeline be? So. Great. I had a quick chat to Steve Sanderson a little bit earlier, mm. and I said to him, you know, where do you see the future with this WebAssembly and Blazor? Um, and he said to me, well, he thinks that the real benefit is going to be that people will be able to use the languages that That's they right. know to build the client side as well as the back end. That's right. So it's going to make it a lot easier for people. I think so. I mean, a lot of people look at Node today, one of the big advantages, obviously, is that it's JavaScript on the server or TypeScript yes. and TypeScript in the client. And with WebAssembly, it now just becomes an endpoint. Rather than having mm. to transpile to JavaScript, you transpile to WebAssembly through the standard tool chains that we have. Yep. You could write in C++, you could write yep. in Java, you could write in .NET um, and have it all go down and run in a runtime in the browser. It's pretty cool. A great opportunity. Probably right. take one more. Yeah. Damien, um, big fan, thank you. Huh. Uh, just uh, regarding the ASP.NET Core 2 now that's, uh, that is out there, I saw there's a lot of changes with the Kestrel engine there. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of those changes? Mm. With, uh, so specifically in 2.0, we did a couple of things. Um, we refactored Kestrel to allow us to very easily plug in different transports. So Kestrel in 1x is very much tied to libuv which is the C library that Node uses to do cross-platform networking. Um, in 2.0, it's not anymore. We have a libuv adapter, eff effectively, um, that plugs into Kestrel, but we also have a sockets transport, one that uses system.net.sockets, which we hope to productize and make the default at some point in the future. And you can write your own transport and plug it in. We also made it easy to plug in different HTTP parsers. Um, and more of that was just for us, so that we could iterate and try different techniques without having to like completely gut the code base. Um, the other thing that we want to do with Kestrel moving forward, oh, the other thing we did in 2.0, sorry, is that we added a whole bunch of limits. And so that you can now configure Kestrel with request limits and memory limits, um, timeouts and things like that and we do that by default so that it's a lot more secure and you can run it as an edge server without having to be behind mm. sort of a more traditional web server. Moving forward, we want to turn Kestrel into more than a web server. We really just want to turn it into the application networking server for ASP.NET Core. Mm -hmm. And as we move beyond HTTP, that means it has to do things that aren't HTTP. We need to be able to support raw TCP and whatever mm -hmm. new protocols, things like Quick. Um, HTTP 2, we've already added support for post 2.0. We have a prototype of it now. It'll be in 2.1. Okay. Um, and you know, the, the web hasn't stayed still. We've got all these new protocols coming out now that we still consider as part of web programming that aren't HTTP 2. We need Kestrel to be able to support those. So. That's fantastic. It sounds like 2.1 is going to be another very big release. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, Damo. Thanks for meeting with us today. I know no you're problem. in a hurry, so we'll wrap it up there. I'm Jason Taylor for SSW TV. Thank you. Thank you.